Hey everybody, good to see you this morning. Well, actually, I guess I can't see you, but it's a uh, miss you guys. Wished you were here with me. Uh, it's great to be in the house of the Lord, uh, wherever we are studying God's word. Uh, look forward to next Sunday. The plan is as of today, we'll reopen next Sunday and the youth are going to do the service. I think it's going to be awesome. We'll hear about their uh, camp experience at camp. We'll uh, hear some testimonies and we'll hear some songs and Lacey and the other leaders will uh, be giving us uh, details. And uh, so it'll be great. Uh, Bucky may even have some good stories, him and Ed, about the trip down and the trip back. So uh, maybe we can get them to share them with us also. If you would uh, bow with me this morning. Our Father in heaven, we gather again today with the wonderful opportunity to worship you and to study your holy word. Father, in these times that we live in, it's awesome to know that you're in control of all things. Father, we thank you for, for your love for us, a love that goes beyond our comprehension, a love so great that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the savior of all who call upon his name. Father, we ask your blessings upon the message this morning and may it bring peace, comfort, and bring the re realization for the necessity of trusting Jesus for salvation. And it's in his name I pray, amen. I wanna cut, touch on a couple of issues this morning. Uh, I like to talk about things that people might be talking about, might be thinking about in their own lives. Well, I've talked to you many times about my early Christian teaching, and it was a good one. Uh, my mom saw to it that we were uh, in church every week, and we were talking about different things. Uh, I do recall that church, uh, my, some of the teaching within the church caused me some agony. I'll just be honest with you about that. Um, church services was a solemn event. Uh, and uh, death was talked about quite often. And death was, uh, gosh, let's see what I can say this. Death was to be feared. The reason that death was to be feared from a little boy's standpoint, and it went on for several years, was that I was taught when you, when this body died, that you were just put in a six foot hole until Jesus returned. I never found a great deal of comfort in that thought. The thought of being in a cold, dark ground was far from where I wanted to be. Now, I did pay attention, sometimes in church, uh, sometimes it took an ear twisting, and as uh, that happened many times uh, out of necessity, no doubt. But uh, I recall the verses and others like it that was used to uh, point out the, the teaching that they were doing about uh, what happens at death and I wanted to share those with you this morning or at least one or two of them uh, in first Thessalonians 4 16 it says for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and verse 17 goes on to say then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air or in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And in verse 18 says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Paul said to comfort one another with these words. Uh, truthfully, it never comforted me. Paul is writing here to tell us exactly what's going to happen when the Lord returns. First, it's going to be obvious what's going on. When he returns, this shout and this trumpet of God that's going to sound is going to be unmistakable. You're not going to wonder 
what that was. Those that teach that the body and soul go into the casket use the dead in Christ shall rise first. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. But let's take a look at what is going to happen on that glorious day when Jesus returns. Those of us who are still alive in the body and on this earth are going to witness something absolutely remarkable. We're going to see people rising from the grave to meet Jesus in the air. Now, as I was doing this, I got to thinking, you know, uh, I do a lot of funeral services. And you know how cool it would be to be doing a graveside service when the Lord returns? You're going to be standing there and you're going to see people coming out of the ground everywhere. And it's not going to be like it is in the sci-fi movies where you see ghosts or skeletons or whatever it is. You're going to see a whole body. Again, watch, watch this. Watch this, uh, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 53. He says, For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perish, perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This body we run around in, I've mentioned it a thousand times, is the perishable body that Paul is speaking of. Like it or not, it dies a little bit each day. You can work out every day. You can eat vegetables only every day. And one day it's still going to play out. And it perishes. And it's put in the ground. And frankly, uh, it decays. It's no longer used. But on that great day... In an instant, it's going to become imperishable. Now, people may ask, and it's controversial in some circles, what about those that's been cremated? Well, I would ask those people, what about the Christians or anyone who has been uh, killed in a horrific explosion? Those that were buried at sea. Those that may have been... Uh, just what's the word I'm looking for is is they're in a horrific accident and there's nothing to be found well the the easy thing the easy answer to that and it is an easy one the God that created the heaven and earth returning you and your body to human form only in its glorified state is not going to be a problem. Now during phase two of this, which is going to happen almost simultaneously, is going to make the atheist and those who have never trusted Jesus for salvation, they are going to be really sick. The words, uh-oh, doesn't do justice as to how they're going to feel at that instant. At the instant they realize that they've been wrong. Or the instant they realize that they have known about Jesus, but they waited too late to trust him as their Savior. They're going to be standing there talking with a Christian, maybe riding in a car with a Christian, uh, sitting beside one at a ball game. Maybe they're office, in an office together. They're at home. Uh, but you get the picture. Uh, they see this. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be singing I'll Fly Away as I'm headed up to sea to meet with Jesus. Now, I want to get back to the teaching for just a second that the body and the soul go into the grave. And there's going to be people that may watch this and they're going to disagree with me forever. But that's okay too. Falling asleep in the Bible means dead physically. Dead in Christ also means dead physically. Some, way, some things it says falling asleep in Jesus. Some it says dead in Christ. In the Bible, they mean the same thing. Uh, dead in Christ means dead physically, but a saved Christian. If it says falling asleep in Christ, it means the same thing. The body has died, but they were saved at death. Maybe, maybe you're like me. And the thought of everything just went into the grave. Body and soul both went in. When you do as many funerals as I do, someone is bound to disagree with something that you say. It's happened a couple of times to me and they didn't make any bones about it, but that was all right. But had this one person after a service one day come to me and tell me it was wrong for me to tell families that their loved one is in heaven. When it's obvious to look right there, they're in the casket. Now this person was very nice about it. And frankly, it caught me off guard. But the answer is very clear. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul writes, it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and watch this, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. You see, the answer lies right there in verse 14. It plainly states that Jesus will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him, the Christians. In other words, the believers. So when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he says, we're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. The very instant this body plays out, our soul, who makes us what we are, is with the Lord. When he returns that's what he's bringing back to be reunited with this glorified imperishable body that we now have. If it weren't so, it wouldn't, if, 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 if all of it was in the ground, if body and soul was buried in the casket, it would be any, uh, who's he going to bring back? It wouldn't be necessary to bring anyone back. We're all in the ground, but that's not the case. The body is in the ground. The soul went to be with Jesus at the last breath. Well, look at Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 again. It says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Now, this is not a hard verse to understand in the least, but it's a difficult verse to put into practice. The Apostle Paul wants us to understand about those that have passed away and fallen asleep. He wants us to understand that this body, and the Bible often calls it a tent, will not live forever, but the soul will. And he says that we should not grieve like the unsaved, for they have no hope. Now, in my little mind, that doesn't mean we shouldn't grieve over the death of a loved one, because we are going to grieve over the death of our loved ones. 
We grieve over the loss of companionship, being able to hold our loved ones and touch our loved ones and to sit around and talk with them, fellowship with them. But during all that, during that grieving, we should also try to remember what we have, a blessed hope of knowing that they are with Jesus and we will see them again. Now, that brings us to the second thing that I wanted to talk about today. And I promise to be brief on it. So when we as believers, as Christians die, will we know our loved ones in heaven? Trust me on this one. This question is probably number two behind, only second to the question of why or why did this happen? This question comes up quite often. Will we know our loved ones in heaven? Well, the short answer would be yes. But let's put some biblical scripture and some examples along with it. The first clear example of that we're going to recognize people in heaven happened on resurrection morning. Mary Magdalene recognized Jesus after he had returned from the dead. She had gone to the tomb and saw it was empty. She was distraught at that what she found or didn't find. In John chapter 20, starting in verse 14, it, it gives the narrative on it. It says, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, what's this? She turned around toward him and cried out in aromatic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now, doubters will try to say that, well, she didn't recognize him at first. That's easily explained, at least it is in my mind. She was distraught, thinking that he had been stolen out of the tomb. She was surely weeping to the point that she could hardly even see. And she wasn't expecting Jesus to be standing there. And verse 16 says, when he called to her or called her name, she turned toward him and recognized him. So she was basically maybe saw the gardener who she thought was the gardener out of the corner of her crying eyes and she didn't realize who it was. But when he called her name and she turned toward him, she recognized it was Jesus. Now, later on that same day, as we discussed a few uh, Sundays ago, on that resurrection day, he appeared to his disciples that very evening in the upper room where they had gathered. They had gathered there to try to figure it all out in their mind. And first thing they know is Jesus is standing in the room with them. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 6 it says, After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. And Paul writes, says, most whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What he's saying at the time of his writing, that most who had seen Jesus alive were still alive. But he used the term, some had fallen asleep, or some had passed away. Goes on in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 7 says, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, 
Paul writes this, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Now, what did Paul mean by abnormally born? Here's what he means. He never quite felt worthy of meeting Jesus because he had once persecuted Christians. As much as he did for Jesus and the cause to spread the gospel, he never felt fully worthy, it doesn't seem. And in another instant that's been used many, many times, uh, will we know our loved ones in heaven? In Luke chapter 16, it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, as we remember, uh, the rich man was wealthy. Lazarus was poor. Uh, he just wanted crumbs off the rich man's table, if possible. But the rich man died, and Lazarus died. And now, get this. Even from hell, this rich man recognized Lazarus and Abraham in heaven. And we know the story goes on as he begged Abraham to send Lazarus back to tell his brothers that, hey guys, this is real stuff. Uh, you better trust Jesus. But that didn't happen. Abraham went ahead to tell him, said if they wouldn't have believed when, they, when Lazarus was on earth, they're not going to believe him now. Anyway, another example is, is Peter, James, and John. They recognized Jesus, but they also recognized Moses and Elijah who had gone on years before. What's this? It's in Matthew chapter 17, starts in verse 1. It says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Now watch. Just then... There appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Can you imagine? <laughs> In verse 4, Peter said this. He said to Jesus, he said, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I'll put up three shelters for you. One for Moses and one for Elijah. Yes, friends. We will see our loved ones again. The soul of man never dies. When we take that final breath, when our heart beats for that last time, our eternal fate is sealed. The decision to choose or reject Jesus stopped. And at the very instant of death and you leave that body you'll be greeted at the gates of heaven by the loved ones who have gone on before and there you will reside in the presence of the Lord forever now to me that has comfort written all over it that gives me great hope for the future that knowing that at some point this whole body of mine is going to perish i've mentioned the example sometimes i think of it like my truck that's parked outside assuming that i live long enough that truck is going to play out and that truck is nothing without somebody in it so I ride around in that truck 
One day it's going to just play out. It's not going to run anymore. Now, I'm not going to die at the same time that truck does, hopefully. When that truck stops running, I'm going to step out of that truck. And I'm going to leave that thing behind. I'm going to continue to live. Same way with this body. When this body finally plays out, me, the soul that makes me me, is going to step out of it. Step right out of it. Step into the arms of Jesus. I hope that comforts each and every one of you. If you would, if you'd bow with me. Father God, we just thank you for another beautiful day. We thank you for a great opportunity to come into your house to worship. Father, although we're doing it in a virtual world now, we know that we'll be back soon. We know that you have everything in control. We know that this virus will one day pass. Father, I just pray as it does that we will all set our direction, set our sights on doing a better job for you, doing more to further your kingdom, to take the good news of salvation out to the entire world that on that day that you return, that your, your hope, your wish that none should perish will come to pass. Father, we just need to realize that we have that great decision to make. And Father, I pray right now that anyone that's hearing this message today has never trusted you, Jesus Christ, for our salvation would do so before this old body plays out. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. And we thank you so much. In the sweet name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Appreciate all of you being this morning, uh, tuning in and listening to the service online. Um, everything going to be all right. Can't wait to uh, get back into church next Sunday. Looking so forward to that. Uh, miss you guys. Uh, it's just not, it's great to be able to have a way to communicate and to put the messages out each week. But it's not the same as fellowship with one another. Love you guys. Hope to see you next Sunday. If you need anything in the meantime, you, I'm easy to find. Easy to get a hold of. In the meantime, watch out for one another. Be good to each other. And may God bless. Y'all have a good rest of the day, rest of the week. See you later.